Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, once again, thanks to Warren and the organizers for having me here at B-Sides. To be honest, it's the first time for me to speak at uh, B-Sides, so I'm a bit nervous. Apologize for that. Um, uh, so bear with me, please. Um, my name is Kostin Rayo. I am the uh, director of Kaspersky's global research and analysis team, also known as GREAT. Um, and I've been uh, doing this kind of thread research uh, for some time now. Um, probably you guys are familiar with some of our publications or some of our big discoveries. Um, well, Duke Q2, for instance, was one of the things that we discovered in 2015 in our own network. Uh, but sometimes it's funny when you're looking for sophisticated stuff, uh, you know, all around the world and you catch things. And then one day you discover something even more sophisticated in your own company's network, uh, which is the iron. Uh, now, to be honest, thinking, um, uh, going back and thinking about some of these things, maybe it wasn't the smartest uh, idea in the world to announce them. Probably the equation thing was not very smart to announce. Um, probably you've seen the uh, fallback for our company from that. Uh, I do remember another case. In 2010, I was invited to present at a conference uh, in uh, Vancouver, in Canada. One of my colleagues uh, was invited to speak about Stuxnet. Um, just a quick check. <laughs> Bless you. Um, how many people know about Stuxnet or heard the name of Stuxnet? Okay. Um, one of my colleagues, Alex Gostev, was invited to make a speech about Stuxnet there. And, um, well, he couldn't get the visa in time, so he asked me, can you go instead? And I said, sure, no problem, but what is this Stuxnet thingy? I wasn't, to be honest, paying attention very much to these APT things back then. And, okay, I, I read all the documentation. We actually found one of the zero days, and we, we reported it to Microsoft. So I went there, and, you know, as soon as I started speaking about Stuxnet, I realized it was like a tension in the air. Not just that, but I looked back in the room, and, you know, just at the far corner, there were three guys. Uh, everybody was uh, seating, but there were, like, three guys there standing uh, uh, of, uh, you know, they looked a bit uh, Middle, middle uh, Eastern-ish. And they looked, like, not very pleased with the kind of things that I was saying. Um, and later I asked the organizers, who are those guys? And they said, we don't really know. They just came at the last minute. They paid in cash. And, you know, next to their organization name, they wrote GOI. So we don't really know what that means. Um, so I said, all oh, right, obviously there's something going on here. So I went back home, and about two weeks later, I found a gift in my living room. It was a uh, rubber cube with a message, which was, take a break. So obviously this kind of research we were doing was not uh, pleasing everybody, and some people wanted us to take a break. Which, to be honest, for a while, I did take a break. When you, when you find such a gift in your home, you take a break. <laughs> um, but not for long. I think it was just a couple of months. And then we continued. I don't know if it was good or bad, but this is just uh, the thing, some of the things we published about all the way up to 2017. Well, we have other things, but they just don't fit uh, in the screen anymore. All right. So, probably... A I think a good um, subject nowadays is all this fake news <clears throat> and attribution. And if you go back, uh, it kind of started uh, around uh, 2016 with the USA presidential elections. I was in Barcelona with one of my good friends, uh, Ryan Narain. We were talking about the uh, possible outcome of the elections. And he said, you know what, <clears throat> there's this guy, uh, he writes for New York Times, and he has like a method, statistical method, which predicts who will be the winner of these elections. And he's got it right like for the past, I don't know, 15 years or so. He's always got this uh, winner right because his method is uh, impeccable. It's, you know. Um, and I said, so who, who is the winner according to this guy? He said, for sure it will be Clinton. I said, are you absolutely confident? Yes. All right, no problem. Well, the election day comes, and, you know, I wake up in the morning just to check uh, the results. So uh, I open my laptop, I go to Google, and what to search for? I search elections. And that's like uh, the first hit in there is just a photo of a lady who looks very sad like this. 
So what's going on? <laughs> Obviously, we know what's going on. Uh, well, it was really, it's quite difficult to find a picture of these two guys looking nice and friendly. Like most of the other photos you find on the internet, they're like uh, upset or yelling at each other or something. Um, maybe not so many people remember that actually before the U.S. presidential election, there was this guy called Guccifer. Uh, and Guccifer was actually a Romanian taxi driver uh, going by the name Marcel Lazar Leher. And he was one of the first guys who claimed to have hacked uh, Hillary Clinton's email server, the very famous email server. And he not only uh, said that, yeah, I, I know she has a mail server, I hacked it, and there's like a bunch of other people who hacked the server as well, so we were kind of partying with each other on the server, you know. Everybody knows each other from the uh, mail server days. So what was uh, this guy doing? He was a uh, hacker and a taxi driver. He was mostly uh, uh, kind of self-thought. And one of his mottos, why this nickname Guccifer, he said it because it, he combines the style of Gucci with the light of uh, Lucifer, whatever that means. Uh, so to be honest, he had no skills. Uh, he had no knowledge of hacking. Everything he knew was from the internet. Well, however, with all this, like, uh, not necessarily saying he was a, a hacker, but he was more like of a script kitty with a, uh, with a fashion sense. Um, he was able to hack uh, Colin Powell, Rockefeller, uh, FBI and uh, US Secret Service agents, Corina Kretsu, which probably nobody knows who she is, but I'll tell you she's a Romanian politician, and uh, he also managed to hack George Mayor. Now George Mayor was the head of the Romanian intelligence service, and this guy managed to hack his email account, um, which obviously, to be honest, nobody in Romania cared when this guy was hacking all this uh, Rockefeller, Colin Powell guys, but when Guccifer hacked the head of the Romanian intelligence service, well, that's when things basically uh, uh, changed. So he not only said, but he started, you know, blackmailing the head of the Romanian intelligence service. He called him a skunk, and he was asking him for money not to release his private emails. It's kind of funny to know how he actually succeeded in hacking uh, Corina Crezzo. She had a, a Yahoo account, and what he did was pretty simple. Um, he tried to reset her uh, password, and there were two questions. One of the name of the city where she grew up, and he knew, because she was born in a city in Romania called Braila. The other thing, uh, the other question was the name of the street uh, where she grew up, and he didn't know it. So what did he do? He went to uh, the map of Braila, he tried all the street names, and he actually got the right one. So that's how he hacked her account, and probably others. Now, as I was saying, everything uh, was kind of quiet, uh, as long as he was hacking, uh, you know, the other side. However, when he hacked the uh, top intelligence man in Romania, George Mayer, uh, it took about two weeks to find him and to arrest him. So he got arrested and eventually he got uh, extradited to the United States. Now, why is this interesting? Because, uh, well, when the DNC announced they got hacked and they hired, actually they hired CrowdStrike for that, I think this was a kind of turning point in the elections. Um, well, they claimed that the hack was done by two APT groups, one of them called Fancy Bear, also known as Sophocy and APT28, the other one, called Cozy Bear. And, um, well, nobody disputed these claims until maybe, let's say, a few hours later when a blog appeared um, from a guy calling himself Guccifer 2.0, saying, like, you know, all these fancy things, uh, APTs, they don't exist, it's all fake. It's actually just me, uh, and I hacked the DNC just alone by myself, and, uh, you know, there's no story here. And to prove it, here are some documents from the DNC. Um, now, why? this is interesting because um, obviously maybe a few people believed him, but not just everybody. And um, Lorenzo Franceschi Bichierai from Motherboard, he actually took the time to, to do an interview with uh, Guccifer 2.0. And he asked, where are you from? He said, I'm from Romania, you know. So uh, Lorenzo, he is Italian, but he, I think he used also Google Translate to try to speak a bit in Romanian with uh, Guccifer just to test his language skills. 
So, for instance, he said, why did you put metadata in the documents, like Russian metadata? To which uh, Guccifer answered, uh, este filigranul meu, which is another way of saying it's my watermark. And then he keeps uh, using this word uh, filigrane a couple of times. And now, to be honest, it's not just that, but he actually he makes a bunch of other mistakes. So this is not perfect Romanian. Um, this is like a kind of, you know, rookie kind of Romanian, not uh, necessarily perfect. So one of the things here is that this word filigrane is extremely, extremely rare in the Romanian language. I have probably friends uh, my age who never used this word in their life. Because nobody uses, if we want to say watermark, we say watermark. We don't use this fancy word filigrane. So, if you're wondering where it was coming from, if you just uh, uh, go to Google Translate and you type this uh, filigrane word, you'll just get watermark. So, it's like just, let's say, another proof that things were kind of fishy. And we did get a confirmation recently when the Mueller indictment was posted and, well, uh, this uh, Mueller indictment goes through the uh, uh, timeline of the DNC hack, and they say, like, well, the conspirators logged into a Moscow-based server, um, and then they um, basically created this uh, Guccifer 2.0 persona in order to undermine the uh, results of the CrowdStrike research. And how do they know it? Basically, because they, um, well, um, searched, we assume, on Google for certain keywords. Like, for instance, some hundred shits, DC leaks, Illuminati, worldwide now. And actually, you know, he posted this, uh, they posted it on WordPress, and they did use all these uh, things they were searching on Google. Like, for people who don't speak English natively, sometimes you do search, you have uh, like an idea how to say something, but you search it on Google just to make sure it's a decent English, you know, it's not broken English. So, this, let's say, uh, is like the way they operate. Of course, uh, it's a reminder to everybody that everything you search on Google gets locked, probably forever. And if somebody wants to find it or ask for it, probably they'll have this capability and they will be able to see what you are searching for at any point in your life. Um, so what's missing from, by the way, what's missing from this Mueller indictment? I think there's a very, very cool point missing, and I wonder what will happen with that. Um, if you remember, CrowdStrike said this hack was done by two APT groups, one of them Cozy Bear, one of them Fancy Bear. So, to be honest, all this Mueller indictment, it deals with the Fancy Bear and another group we call Hades. However, so far, we have not seen any kind of... Uh, indictments or political, let's say, outreach in regards to this other APT group called Cozy Bear. So it makes you wonder what's going on, like are they probably next in line and uh, I assume that this is part of maybe another big story. So yeah, where are, where are all the Dukes? Nobody knows, but probably it'll be an interesting story when they get published. Um, now I remember actually last year, it was a Friday, uh, in May, and you know, usually Fridays try to be quiet. So you go to work, well, do some things for a couple of hours, and we all go home, right? So there was a Friday last year in May. I go work, and the first thing I see is a message from one of my colleagues in Spain, and he says, Well, we have a, a huge outbreak here in Spain. And I'm like, Dude, on a Friday, come on. <sighs> Nobody wants outbreaks on Fridays, I mean neither malware authors or security researchers. And I'm like, maybe, you know, if we forget about it, maybe it'll pass away. Well, it didn't. So things got worse and worse, and maybe you remember what happened on May 12th when displays were looking something like this. Um, in Spain, like they say, yeah, the Zigwal displays look like that. In hotels, ATMs in uh, Russia, um, well, this was the uh, uh, transportation uh, in, uh, I think, in Frankfurt, ATMs in Asia, pretty much all around the world. The screens were kind of red with the very well-known message, which actually led people to... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the great thing about people, uh, that you know how to <clears throat> make fun of everything. 
By the way, Nokia is making a comeback. I hear it's very fashionable to have these new Nokia phones with a battery that lasts for three weeks. Probably we'll get one of those. Yeah, microwave ovens. Yeah, Google glasses, air conditioning, <laughs> Fitbits. <laughs> My favorite. Yeah, and cars. Even the Matrix probably got owned by uh, WannaCry. Um, well, everybody was wondering, wow, this is like a huge thing out of nowhere, but who's behind it? So to be honest, it was kind of quiet. All of us, I tell you, that uh, that weekend I worked Saturday, I worked on the Sunday, I worked the whole day on Monday, and we were wondering who is behind it, like who, um, well, it's like not surprising that somebody took a zero day developed by an intelligence agency and uh, used it to build a worm. But uh, like still, uh, the code, like the code base of this uh, threat is kind of new, so who is behind it? It wasn't until I think it was about 11 in uh, uh, Romania or maybe around this time that Neil Mehta from Google posted this beautiful tweet uh, which uh, confused a bunch of people and while the other, let's say, um, half said yes, obviously. So, yeah, what, what did he mean by this uh, Number. So obviously we have two hashes and two, uh, two offsets for each uh, sample over there. So actually what he meant, he pointed to one of uh, the WannaCry samples, an older version. I actually had a um, subroutine which was identical to a sample previously used by the Lazarus group. So as a way of saying that we know that this WannaCry thing is a project of the Lazarus group, which if people don't know is a North Korean uh, APT. So recently, of course, uh, they've been indicted uh, as well for this. But of course the question is how did Google manage to do this when everybody else you know, was uh, struggling for the weekend and wondering what's uh, uh, this WannaCry thing about it. <clears throat> now, if you remember, in 2011, Google bought a company called Zynamix, uh, and I had a talk in 2014 with a guy uh, working at Google, and we were saying, like, how do we find samples? Like, I have this, uh, you know, pattern I want to search, but if I search it in our collection, it will take me, like, two months. And he said, come on, dude, CPU time is cheap. You just pin uh, 10,000 machines and you do a grab. It's, like, two hours. And I'm like, well, <laughs> I go to my boss, <clears throat> the company CTO, and say, boss, I need 10,000 machines. His answer was not very pleasant. Uh, well, obviously, well, this allowed them in 2017 to go link WannaCry to Lazarus. And to be honest, Google is not the only company with such capabilities. There's another company, it was called Binarly. It was now uh, acquired by CrowdStrike, which can do the same kind of... Uh, Magic, and there's another company now uh, in Israel called Intezer, which have a very, very cool technology allowing them to do exactly the same. And of course, this got me thinking, and how do you design this kind of code similarity technology without having to buy 10,000 machines or investing huge amounts of money? So actually, it's not that hard. You can, for instance, generate uh, strings, binary strings out of samples, and uh, then you just check for overlaps for new files. The only issue is that our collection is uh, way too big. So at the moment, our malware collection is five petabytes. So if you want to search five petabytes for all these things, obviously, it will be way, way too slow. So one of the things uh, we've done and I want to talk um, about is uh, APT similarity search using uh, Yara. How many people are familiar with Yara? Wow, that's a lot. Well done. Um, <clears throat> Yara, for those who don't know, is a, um, well, pattern matching language developed by Victor Manuel Alvarez, who now works for Google. Um, and it's actually one of the most powerful things uh, you can use when uh, you work in security threat research because it allows you very um, easily to create uh, uh, rules to match <clears throat> malware samples. So for instance, um, uh, I like to think that this is a lot more powerful than IOCs. So for instance, let's say I'm investigating some attack and I'll give you guys a hash and a domain. So what can you do with that? 
Well, in theory, with a the hash, you can find a sample, sure, but in some cases, each uh, sample is unique, so you'll never find a sample. With the domain, what can you do? Well, basically, you can block it in your firewall, and that's all. If I give you a Yara rule, then automatically you will see, uh, let's say, uh, things which are specific to this sample. What are the kind of unique things about that sample? So that's why it's so much powerful. So what do we do? For instance, we can identify the relevant parts in malware samples, and then we can try to build a Yara rule from that. The only issue is, of course, there's like a lot of strings in a sample. So for instance, a Y100K file has about uh, 102, uh, well, 384, 16 byte substrings in it. So even if you filter out, let's say, the clean ones, you still have about 30,000 strings in the sample. So how do we know? Well, obviously we cannot keep 30,000 strings for everyone, uh, for every single sample. So what do you do? For instance, um, if we look at these two strings, which are extracted from the same sample, we immediately you, as humans, uh, understand that the first one is more interesting than the second one. So what's the second one? It's like a 20, 0, 0, then a bunch of CC. Anybody knows what CC means? What was it? Sick trap? Well, in three, correct, it is. It is in three on the Intel x86 architecture. So, like a bunch of uh, in threes are not gonna find us, let's say, unique malware samples. So, if you know what to search and what to select for, these are the kind of Yara rules that you'll write. So, for instance, this one, uh, you see there's like a bunch of shellcode fragments. They do not appear in any clean samples in our collection. And I like to think we have the largest um, clean files collection in the world, probably about 400 million files. Um, so this actually can help you find a lot of interesting stuff. Of course, this can be further improved. For instance, you can generate the Yara rule, you can test it on uh, a set of samples, and then you keep only those uh, unique patterns which match across the entire family. And that's how you make it more efficient, more efficient, and so on. And this is how you find other samples produced by the same actor. So just a few numbers, um, uh, just to, to brag a bit about our system. Um, well, we process about a quarter million files per day. Uh, we have about 6 billion clean strings in there and about 10 billion known clean opcode sequences. So this allows us actually to do some cool things, which uh, I want to show you next. So I call this, you know, attributing APT malware by uh, common code. Um, one good example for here is the ShadowPad APT. I don't know how many people follow this story, but last year, uh, I'll tell you how we found it. Uh, we got a phone call from a uh, from a big customer from a bank, and they said we suspect that we have an infection in our network. So we said, "How do you know?" They said, "Well, we see DNS requests to some domains which are like very shady. Uh, they come from a computer which is very sensitive. However, we can't find whatever program or malware is making these connections. Like there's nothing." We went there, obviously, uh, we started looking around, we made the memory dump, uh, we searched the memory dump for those particular DNS requests, and we found a fragment of code which was responsible for that. Now, the funny thing that it was actually inside a legitimate software from a company called NetSarang. So we looked at their website, downloaded the installers, and discovered that one of their WinSock libraries has been trojanized with a very nice encrypted payload, like a sophisticated malware system um, that produced those DNS requests. So who was behind the attack? Well, we were able to find the common fragment of code between plugins from this shadow pad and plugins observed uh, in a WinNTI uh, incident. Maybe um, some of you have heard about WinNTI. Uh, it's a malware which is used uh, probably by several APT groups. Uh, Microsoft calls uh, one of them uh, Barium, and that one is a very, very interesting uh, APT group which specializes in this kind of supply chain attacks. They hack the company, and then that software, which is pretty much being used everywhere, uh, well, is their entrance vector into the organizations. In case you're wondering what this code is, it's a unique hashing, uh, API hashing algorithm, which is used uh, only in these uh, two samples. So 
it's very specific and it's only used by this group and makes us believe that they were responsible for this shadow pair compromise. Another uh, very interesting case was the sea cleaner incident was published by our friends from Talos as well by uh, another company um, called Morphisec from Israel. Uh, there wasn't, let's say, pretty obvious who is behind this huge compromise. I think uh, uh, Avast talked about several million victims uh, in this attack. But if you look at the uh, code from this malware, we find a custom uh, Base64 encoding subroutine uh, was spotted by our system. And this is something we have seen it before with a malware sample uh, called Missile from an uh, APT group known as APT17. So when we did this, I, you know, I posted it on Twitter uh, just uh, for other researchers to, to check it as well. And it was pretty, uh, I would say, quick that uh, in Tether, this Israeli company, they also confirmed the overlap. So by the way, um, the same, um, uh, well, we call them genotypes. So these fragments of code we extract from malware samples uh, that are specific to that malware sample, we call them genotypes. So we checked our APT collection with them and we immediately found a bunch of other samples like uh, this uh, missile from Aurora Panda, Zox PNG, Hikit, and Gressem. Um, so there's like overlap for this custom Base64 with all these other samples which are used pretty much, let's say, by the same guys. And in case you're wondering what is this missile, uh, Chris McConkey, which is here in the audience somewhere, I, I think, uh, has an amazing uh, presentation about this missile uh, thingy. Uh, it's one of the guys who probably worked as a developer for several IPT groups, uh, and he was able to dox a uh, missile pretty, pretty well, I would say. And another thing is that Noveta published a report about uh, the malware samples used by, uh, they call it the Axiom group. And they say that, for instance, uh, tools which have only been used by Axiom include Hikit, this Hikit and Zox PNG, which share the same code with the malware from the CCleaner incident. Well, Another case, uh, which is quite interesting in my opinion, is uh, from an uh, APT called the Regen or Regen. Um, if you're not familiar with it, Symantec uh, was the first to publish about it in 2014, and we uh, followed as well with a um, big paper on this. It was probably one of the most sophisticated APTs we have seen, and one of the cool things about them was their uh, attacks on GSM uh, base towers and GSM uh, equipment. Now, the Yara rule that we wrote for Regin, or better said, the system wrote for Regin, it found a file from the shadow broker's dump called CNLI-1DLL. So that was like immediately surprising. That one and let's say pretty much nothing else outside of it. So when we looked in there, we noticed there were a lot of uh, functions exported by CNLI-DLL, such as CNE file IO, CNE file IO, dear open, and so on. Um, if you're wondering, what do you think uh, CNE stands for? Yes, it, it probably means computer network exploitation, which is another word for cyber espionage, let's call it. Uh, the destructive things being called computer network attack. So, well, if you look at the code, what is the overlap? Well, the overlap, they have uh, wrapper functions for all the, uh, let's say, big uh, APIs in the system. So, like, uh, dear open, file open, all of them are wrapped by this library, probably for portability. This way, you can link to this library and then you can run it pretty much anywhere on kind of any operating system. How are we doing on time? <laughs> all right, two more hours, don't worry. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, here's another case. Uh, we call it the Lamberts. Um, this is another, let's say, kind of uh, sophisticated thing uh, we, uh, we research. They've been around for a long time, so. Uh, it all started with a sample called the Black Lambert. This Black Lambert was originally discovered by FireEye, who found it together with the Zero Day. So they wrote a bit about a Zero Day, um, I think in 2014 in November. Uh, and this was targeting a nuclear research kind of uh, organization in Europe. 
so we started looking at the sample, trying to find others. So for instance, this black Lambert, it had a uh, configuration and inside they had uh, this tool type. It actually it says that tool type, uh, WL build and the build number and the version name. It actually says version name in the config. Wasn't long until we found another sample uh, which had again tool type AA and we were able to determine that this AA stands for Archangel uh, because of a PDB path in the malware. They have the build number which is a bit smaller than the black Lambert. <clears throat> so we've decided to, to call this one the white Lambert just to be politically correct. Uh, then obviously we started finding others, a green Lambert, blue Lambert, uh, red Lambert. Uh, well, I would say that between October 2014 and uh, October 2017, for a total of three years, we found quite a few of them. Each one being like significantly different from the others, but still sharing some common uh, design principles. For instance, either using the same CNCs, the same CNC communication algorithm, the same persistence mechanism, uh, you know, the same file names, and so on. So this took like about three years. And I, I'm not saying that uh, this was the only thing we were doing for three years. And I'm just saying that, uh, well, it took, uh, let's say, about three years to notice all these different ones. So let's see how this code similarity tech does against the Lamberts. Well, if we compare them, pretty much uh, immediately we see that one of the white Lambert drivers has the same fragment of code as the black Lambert phone to exploit, uh, the zero day, as well as the same fragment as the brown Lambert, which is probably one of the latest we found. So this takes like, I don't know, a couple of minutes versus uh, three years, whatever the things we were, let's say, uh, doing in the past in a number of years can now be done in a couple of minutes uh, using this kind of technologies. Um, well, here's an example, let's say a counter example. Uh, I know what you're saying, this is an amazing technology, but let me show you a case when this fails. So the very famous case of the Olympic destroyer, uh, I think Talos was probably the first to write about the Olympic destroyer. Uh, and Pretty soon, different companies, you know, they started to chip in with their attribution and research. Intezer immediately came and they said, we found similarities with Chinese APTs and three of them nonetheless, APT10, APT3, and APT12. Uh, we saw that and were kind of skeptical. That looks very strange. Why would the Chinese target the uh, Olympic Games uh, in South Korea? Then Record the Future came and they said, we found similarities with the Lazarus, which maybe makes a bit more sense because Lazarus is, well, North Korean APT, the games were in South Korea. The North Korean APT group Lazarus has previously targeted South Korea with destructive malware. So maybe this makes a bit more sense. Uh, well, if you look at the code, this is not like, to be honest, we are not disputing it. Uh, there are for sure some similarities in this wiper malware uh, used in the Olympic destroyer incident and an older wiper malware uh, used by Blue Norov. So we were thinking, can we do better? And we uh, tried our own code similarity system against the Olympic destroyer and we didn't find pretty much anything. We didn't find any similarity with the Chinese APTs, uh, but we did find something very odd. So. The system did actually spot uh, one tiny, very tiny similarity with the sample previously used by the Lazarus APT, in particular this blue nor of uh, subset. And this sample was kind of famous because it was used in the Bangladesh uh, bank heist. Uh, however, this was just a small fragment of bytes. It wasn't like, let's say, a, an entire subroutine. And even worse, it was not even in the code. It was in the header, in the PE header. So we discovered that actually the rich headers of the both uh, of these both files were identical. Um, how many people are familiar with the rich headers? All right. Well, again, for those who don't know, the rich headers are kind of a nice uh, thing that Visual C puts into every 
executable you compile, well, the linker actually puts it, and it's like a, uh, an encrypted list of all the different libraries and tools that you use to build the sample. So what does it mean? When you build, let's say, different malware samples on the same system, uh, with the same unique combination of Visual C version and patches, it's quite likely that the rich header will be the same. And actually, we discovered that in some cases, this is like a unique fingerprint for the developer of that malware. So to have, like, across, let's say, our four billion samples in the collection, to have just two with the same rich header, both of them being used, let's say, suspected by a North Korean APT, this cannot be a coincidence. Well, later, we discovered that actually, uh, well, this was just a fake copy. So the attackers behind the Olympic Destroyer, which as an APT group we are now calling Hades, well, they just copied this as a very cool false flag. So they copied the rich header. I, I really don't know if they hoped that someone will find it. Uh, I don't know if they actually knew that we will find it. Uh, but it was interesting that actually our technology spotted this uh, and it, if it wasn't, let's say, for the humans to check the results, uh, we would actually be fooled as well and probably led to believe that uh, it was uh, Lazarus APT group who did the Olympic destroyer attack. So just a few more examples, bear with me. WannaCry, uh, this is a Yara rule that we built for WannaCry from all these opcodes. It catches uh, Blue Norov, Manuscript, and Decafet, which are all malware samples used by uh, Lazarus. You know, it's pretty small. It's just five strings. That's it. Five strings, all of them, they only appear in WannaCry and all these different uh, malware samples uh, used by Lazarus. Now I see Paul is taking notes, writing the strings. Uh, here's another one. This one catches um, dark hotel samples based, um, uh, let's say, on the code that we discovered uh, in an incident we uh, named Scarcraft. Uh, later we discovered that this was pretty much the same APT, except uh, there was another very convoluted false flag operation in which Scarcraft hacked the same command and control server used by Dark Hotel uh, and used it, let's say, one week later uh, in an effort to confuse us. So this is something which, uh, you know, it happens that APTs hack the same CNCs just to uh, use the same infrastructure in attacks to confuse researchers. So I know like for the people who uh, wrote Yara rules before, uh, probably this is how they feel when they see these <laughs> Yara rules with the opcodes. Uh, yeah, I guess it's pretty much the, uh, the kind of uh, new level and it probably it simplifies the whole question of doing attribution of sophisticated attacks. So maybe something you want to call attribution 2.0, uh, automated attribution by code similarity. So what does it mean? Well, I think that tasks which took us years in the past, they can now done let's say in a matter of uh, minutes, like I have, I have shown you with the Lamberts. Uh, However, I think this technology uh, will become so widespread throughout the next years that actually it will uh, not only be partly automated, but I believe that it will have a very significant effect, and that is more false flags. So, for instance, the uh, Lazarus guys, after the NSA said that, uh, you know, uh, WannaCry and Lazarus are North Korean APTs, immediately they started added. Uh, uh, adding Russian keywords in their malware, uh, just because it's fashionable to blame Russia nowadays for anything. Uh, but the other thing was their Russian keywords were like really crappy, like the way the, the keywords were written, you know, for instance, the word Chinik, which means like a teapot, was written in a terrible way. So it didn't fool anyone. But yeah, I think the Olympic destroyer case with the rich header is a beautiful uh, example of how this uh, code similarity um, can actually uh, be fooled, and probably how uh, Intezer and Recorded Future were fooled into giving this mistaken uh, attribution to Chinese uh, uh, APTs and Lazars. 
So what it'll mean? Probably all these APD groups will start moving away from code and instead just use scripts. I mean, when everybody is using a PowerShell, Cobalt Strike, Metasploit, it's becoming almost impossible to know who was it, right? So I'm actually surprised that we don't see this uh, more and more because it makes the attribution question uh, so much more difficult. So I want to um, actually end by saying a few words you know, about the future of security. I like to think that we're probably doing a pretty good job um, catching uh, cyber espionage. And I would say probably we're doing a good job catching uh, cyber sabotage as well, so CNE and CNA. There is one thing which I believe helps like a lot of uh, danger, and it's something that we haven't been able to tackle very well so far. And that is this uh, mass opinion manipulation. So we have probably seen throughout these uh, elections and for the past two years, people are very easily influenceable. And I think that we as a community, uh, probably we can do better and we should do better trying to spot this mass opinion manipulation and trying to help the users. And if we don't do that, the risk will be very simple and it will cost us our democracy and our freedom. So with that in mind, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And happy hunting. Stay foolish, stay great. Thank you.